Once again, good morning, distinguished colleagues. I would like to thank everybody for finding the opportunity and joining us today in our session, not only here in the offline format within the World Trade Center, but also I think those who is joined online. I see that a lot of colleagues are watching us online and uh, participate in this session in the remote format. And so today, within our reports and discussions, if you have any questions, our speakers will be very glad to answer them in an online format as well as in the offline format. I would like to open this session of today's, which is called the development of regional and global networks to detect and respond uh, for epidemiological emergencies. And today, during our session, we will listen to Dr. Yuka Pukula from the WHO Regional Office for Europe. the team leader of the Division of Health Emergencies and uh, Communicable Diseases. Then we'll listen to Igor Karnaukov, the head of the epidemiology at Microbe, the research institute. Then we'll listen to Elena Shamal, the advisor of the Department of Cooperation and Social Affairs, Administration of Humanitarian Cooperation, Political and Social Affairs, CIS Executive Committee. And then we will listen to Dmitry Lyoznov. He is the director of the Research Institute of Influenza Russia. So the pandemic of the novel coronavirus infection has shown us the importance and great significance of uh, networks the groups of people, as well as the importance of uh, communications. It all helps us to identify in a timely manner and respond to some outbreaks of diseases. The networks, or in other words, these groups of people can be built upon absolutely different characteristics. There could be some professional networks that deal with the transfer of information from uh, one epidemiologist to another one. There are also other networks compiled upon the ge geographical criteria, for example, the CIS countries council. There are some other networks as well that gather some medical professionals who work in order to respond to emergencies, in order to help to respond to such emergencies, for example, as the outbreak of infectious diseases. For example, we have a global network on the informing and responding on the uh, infectious diseases, uh, the Quarant City network. There are some other networks that are being coordinated by WHO. And here, I mean the network of contact peoples on the international health regulations. And I'm sure that the next presenter will tell us about this network and about how it was functioning during the outbreak of the novel coronavirus infection. So I invite you to listen to the presentations that will tell you about different formats and uh, ways how to unite people, professionals, and I also invite you to think about how our activities regarding the response to the novel coronavirus infection in the end of the last year and in the beginning of, the, of this present year, how it influenced the ways of the existence of these networks, how the networks become more useful and demanded or less? What are the challenges? What lessons can we draw from the function of these networks? What can we learn from the ways that people communicate with each other, how the information is transferred, and how it all influences the outbreaks of infectious diseases as well as other emergencies? And so now I'd like to give the floor to our first speaker, Dr. Yuka Pukula, the team leader, Division of Health Emergencies and Communicable Diseases at WHO Regional Office for Europe. Yuka, 
Hope you can hear us. Please, the floor is yours. You can say it again. Hello, our, our colleague, they're not here. Can you hear me? It's Yuka Pukila here. Yes, you can. I can we can hear, hear you. But not any others. Okay, Dr. Liosnov. Yes. Is, is on Paul, I can, uh, can see him, but I'm not sure if he's on Poland. So can I start my presentation? Yes, you can start. Please go ahead. Confusion. I'm sharing my slides. Can you see my... Can you see my slide? Yes, we can share, we can see your screen. It's all working all right. So, good morning to everybody. <coughs> Respected chair, the hosts, and the <coughs> organizers, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. And my name is Jukka Pukkila. I work in the WSO regional office for Europe in Copenhagen, and I'm the program area manager for so-called health emergency information and risk assessment department under the WSO emergency program for, for, for Europe. And, and the key task of um, my, my, my team's key tasks is to function as the international health regulations con regional contact point for the Europe maintaining the 24-7 duty officer, so we are always available for communication with all the 55 <coughs> international uh, ISR national focal points in all the European countries. And I have been uh, in this job since 2010 in charge of these ISR communications, so 11 years out of the 14 years when the ISR 2005 has been in, in force. I start my presentation in a bit unusual manner by immediately bringing up the, the key messages or basically the conclusions what I would like to highlight during my presentation. And when speaking about new networks and then developing further regional and global networks for, for managing uh, public health emergencies and especially epidemics and outbreaks, I still would like to draw everybody's attention that we already have a very uh, long history and, 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 and a well-developed basic framework, legally binding framework of the internet health regulations that we would need to, <coughs> to, to, to make, um, make fully functional. And, I can say that during these 11 years, I have never seen that these, uh, these formal IHR communications regulated by Article 6 to 11 of the IHR between WHO and the National IHR focal points and between various national IHR focal points has, would have been working as rapidly and as completely and as well it has, that it has been working from the very beginning of the outbreak in the European region in January 2020. There are only very few exceptions where the, uh, this, this has not been working. But the COVID pandemic has clearly shown to everybody how it affects all sectors of the society and how everybody needs to be involved in managing this. And this has been always the basic message on the IHR that it is not a specific uh, task or network for ministries of health or even more narrowly just for this IHR national focal point, which tends to happen sometimes that everything is left to them. It really <coughs> is supposed to be a whole of government business and, and, and we will need to get it <coughs> implemented as in the whole of all sectors on the basis of whole government, and then we need strong political commitment from the highest levels of the government and as from the society as a whole to get the IHR working as it was intended to work. So although 
some sections of the some parts of the ads are have been working extremely well during the pandemic there's definitely much space for improvement then and of course the national lights are focal points are not the only <coughs> network network there are uh, many many uh, nine nine or more core capacity areas under IHR and there are specialized networks like for laboratories for points of entry <coughs> and uh, for for many others already existing already outside the NFPs the functioning of the IHR during the, uh, the COVID pandemic is now being very carefully examined with an uh, independent IHR review committee. They also examined the functioning of the IHR after the 2009-2010 H1N1 influenza pandemic and after the 2014-2016 Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And now they have been doing ex extensive work work on the functioning of the IHR and they will present maybe not their final results, but at least their findings so far during the World Health Assembly now in May, next month in May. And, and I would encourage all the member states to pay attention and proactively participate in these discussions, how we can further improve the implementation and perhaps even the content of the IHR in going forward to make it do what it was intended, designed to do. And then just a short look into the history. So the IHR actually goes back a couple of hundred of years. It actually initiates from those yellow flags from 17th century when the uh, ships they required if they had uh, serious communicable diseases on board to stay out from the harbor and put a yellow flag into the mast as a sign of the quarantine before they were allowed then to, to, to dock and embark. And, and that is why the first international health regulations booklet was also yellow and the, 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 the <coughs> yellow card is, is, is under its are is that color. And the, during the existence of WHO since 1947, the first uh, form of international health regulations were the international sanitary regulations that were adopted in 1951 in the fourth World Health Assembly. Then they were first uh, further developed and then and, and the first edition of the international health regulation was and, uh, uh, approved in World Health Assembly in 1969, but this, uh, this first edition concentrated on certain communicable diseases only. And in 2000, uh, 1995, the World Health Assembly requested a revision of this IHR. It was seen that the situation has changed the, the, in terms of the volume and speed of international travel and trade, and also that communicable diseases are only some of the public health emergencies the, the, that the IHR should cover all hazards, including chemical, environmental, radionuclear emergencies, and so on. So there was then 10 years of negotiation between the countries to come up with a new version of the IHR, and the, that was then adopted in the World Health Assembly in 2005 and entered into force 15th of June 2007. So it is now soon 14 years when the <coughs> latest version of the IHR has been in force. And, and it, it's a legally binding for 196 state parties, practically all countries of the world. 55 of these state parties in the European region, even we have only 53 member states, but since Vatican, the Holy See, and the Principality Liechtenstein are also so-called states parties <coughs> to IHR, we have 55 in the European region. Then I'm not the only text from the IHR itself that I included in the presentation is the Article 2 that provides the purpose and scope of the international health regulations, the, the, the current 
version and I'm not going to read it aloud here but that really when you go through the text you can see that this is exactly the purpose of the international health regulation to be able to rapidly <coughs> to prevent and to rapidly control and respond to public health emergencies caused by any any hazard so this is really something that we already have and we should be building on then I have sometimes tendency to go, I don't think that there are many IHR national focal points and it's not the purpose to speak about the details of the IHR <coughs> architecture and key functions, but I want to highlight <coughs> the, national, the central role of the, of the national IHR focal point in the system. And, and then that means the, this national lights are focal point really needs to be an institution and an institution that is centrally located and has access to all the required information, uh, both from health sector, but also from, from other sectors. And, and of course, they cannot function if the national health system and, and, and surveillance and response systems are not functioning, both in the health sector and in other <coughs> sectors here, early warning and surveillance of, of events is required. And for us, the National ISR focal point for WHO is the key <coughs> counterpart. So we always go to the National ISR focal point. We don't bypass the ISR NFP in WHO. And there are the formal communications regulated by Article 6 to 11 of the ISR in terms of especially this early detection, assessment, reporting, and mounting an untimely and appropriate response to any public health emergency, <coughs> serious public health emergency. So these are the formal communications that are uh, very precisely defined. Then I have to say about the notification that unfortunately the language is a bit negative and then many times it feels that the countries think that having to notify something on the rights are to WHO is a failure. We see it as a great success and then a sign that the surveillance system and early warning systems in the country, country work, so it should never be seen as a failure. When in doubt, rather notify than not notify <coughs> and their, uh, the, to, to WHO. And then these are really the formal uh, it's our communications in this part of the, the work. And then almost as an extra plus, there is now the global network of 196 national ISR focal points. And, and every national ISR focal point has, has a contact details, so they are free to contact any other national focal point anywhere in the world to share information. We, as a WSO regional contact point, we never contact the national ISR focal points in other regions. We go then through the region, respective region offices and with, uh, through headquarters. But you, as the national ISR focal points, are absolutely free to contact each other. And this is used more and more. We are not at all copied all the time, so we don't even know how much this <coughs> network is being utilized, but, but it is increasingly being utilized and, and uh, especially for international contact tracing purposes. And, and we try to facilitate that this would be, become even more easy and effective to share confidential information between countries through this. Then concentrating on the very beginning of the pandemic, I'm just highlighting some uh, uh, what, what has happened using the IHR during the COVID-19 pandemic. There's a link to the timeline of one year of WHO Europe response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The whole so-called incident management system team, so it's not limited to us and or the, only to the IHR, but there is a day-by-day cases at that the timeline that you can scroll and see the key events and developments, what happened. So I encourage you to visit that one. So already in January, when we learned about this <coughs> outbreak in, in, in China, and whenever when, when the virus was identified in the very beginning of January, WHO shared case definitions <coughs> of, 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 of this new disease and guidance on the 
mandatory notification and reporting of all probable and then confirmed COVID cases to WHO. And, and indeed, in 20, Friday evening, 24th of January, France was in the European region the first country to notify the first COVID cases in the Europe. And then other countries, as you might recall, followed in very rapid succession. And whenever we got the information on the first case, we provided a package of the, the, the guidance documents and, and, and also uh, forms for, for case-based reporting and so on. And we initiated communication with the countries. The notification is never once off event. It is always the beginning of the communication. And we had with many countries uh, a series of video conferences to, to understand what exactly is going on in these countries, especially in, with, with Germany, France, UK, Italy. Anyway, you can see those in the timeline, the various. And then we use the existing information sharing channel, the restricted channel for sharing confidential information with all ISR national focal points. It's called so-called event information site for in the ISR national focal points, EIS. And then whenever there was a new country, we <coughs> were posting information on that unless the country for some reason did not want to do that. But it became immediately <coughs> clear that this is much too rigid and slow reporting in this extremely rapidly evolving situation. So we <coughs> developed the interactive active COVID 19 dashboards in uh, both in English and Russian that came online on public webs uh, on uh, 20th February 2020 and has been updated in terms of uh, new cases and deaths every day, uh, 24 uh, every day, including weekends and all holidays ever, ever since. And this is the first time really that we are counting cases when we have over 140 million cases globally and approaching 50 million cases in, in Europe and that's never been done. Again, here is the, the main page of the dashboard that has become now the most visited ever on WSO Europe website. It has already <coughs> over 10 million visits until now and then it's visited all the time and, and, and then when we are going we have been adding different information and features there unfortunately on the Russian website we had the, <coughs> the basic numbers you can see the total number of cases per country and also the 15, 14 day incidence you can select the view <coughs> but then the more complete set is only unfortunately available on the English dashboard site and the most popular nowadays is the subnational uh, explorer that is also interactive and where you can see uh, we also update it on a daily basis you can see we don't have the subnational data for quite all countries but most of the countries we do have and it really shows where uh, the, the, the pandemic is evolving and how the pandemic is evolving just now i strongly I encourage you to visit this subnational explorer. There's a list on the whole Europe of all the regions with the highest <coughs> seven-day incidence. You can see that the Croatia, Sweden, France, this is from Monday. They're, they're leading there. Then, as already mentioned, there are the many, many other, other networks and then the most important being the joint WSO Europe ECDC flu and network we are all the, the European member states belong and then we are meets this simultaneous translation every two uh, two weeks and the next meeting is actually uh, on Friday day after tomorrow so this is the key network and it has been now expanded from flu to cover also COVID with a COVID surveillance focal point nominated by most countries and, and then there are other networks for the response there is the global outbreak alert and response network and the emergency medical team network where Rosport Repnatsor is a member 
active active member already so this is on the response side of the and, and, and since we have a presentation on, on, on the respiratory surveillance network i don't need to speak more about that i just provided some of the key links to the key networks here but i would like, like to uh, in the end to to, to highlight uh, European Mortality Monitoring Activity or Euromomo network that is supported both, both by WSO Euro and, and ECDC and is actually managed by the Danish Start and Serum Institute. And they are collecting weekly data on excess mortality by any course. And they would very much welcome additional members to join this members. The Israel and Ukraine just joined very recently, but otherwise there's a gap in, in, in Eastern European and, and Central Asian countries. So if you are interested, please pass the message and consider of joining this network to give, get a more comprehensive picture of the excess mortality in the European region. And in the very end, sorry, I know that I have gone over time, but I still included these key messages with which I started but I'm not going to go through. It's only the key message is that let's get international health regulation truly to work as they were intended to work to become a really, really significant tool for the prevention and control of future epidemics and pandemics. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yuka, uh, uh, for your very interesting uh, presentation about uh, ISR and the network of national uh, coordinators of ISR. And I really hope that distinguished colleagues have got a good understanding on how this network is working and how it is cooperating with other networks that are shaped, for example, on the basis of professional um, occupancy of specialists, laboratory professionals within the laboratory activities, or like the networks formed on the basis of uh, certain nosologies, um, like in flu or influenza cases on global, regional and sub-regional level. Yuka, I would like uh, to ask you not to turn, uh, not, not to leave our today's session before it will end, because after uh, all the presentations we will have Q&A session and your participation will be very valuable. Thank you. And now I would like to let the floor to the next presenter, Igor Karnaukhov head of the Department of Epidemiology of Microbe Institute at uh, the uh, Russian uh, uh, Federal Service for Surveillance on Consumer Rights Protection and Human Well-being. The floor is yours. Thank you. Greetings, distinguished colleagues. Today, I want to show you bits and pieces of information on the measures that were taken and are taken in the EECA region uh, in terms of uh, shaping of unified emergency response system for epidemiological threats in a sanitary and epidemiological uh, field. Could you please manage my slides? Well, as uh, Alek Nikolaevich today told us, and I also want to stress it out that pandemics of COVID-19 was a kind of a trigger for shaping of different formats, uh, facilitating the systems of counteraction uh, and uniting our efforts in counteraction the pandemics. But again, in this case, I want to state clearly that the events on shaping of this unified, united system of reaction in the EECA regions, so Eastern Europe and Central Asia, they are facilitated during the last seven years. That means that the 
program was initiated in 2015. And I wanted to stress out the fact that the Russian Federation uh, was uh, consec consecutively supporting the idea of introduction and realization of international sanitary rules starting from 2015. And uh, uh, together with the support of the government of Russian Federation starting from 2015, we are realizing the program that, that which aim is to render the methodological and material and technical support to the partner countries. Countries partnered with Russia in um, terms of introduction of uh, international sanitary rules and support of these rules. And these programs are aimed on uh, uh, backing up of the national potential of the countries, methodology, technology, also staff potential. It all is leading to enhancement of national possibilities uh, and capabilities of states in uh, the field of sanitary and epidemiological surveillance. And at the end of the day, realization of these programs is aimed on creation, in the first line, of a united information and epidemiological space for the countries of Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And secondly, it is aimed on the creation of a united system of monitoring and operative emergency response for epidemiological threats in ECA. And I also wanted to state that along with the realization of these programs, a leading role is played by the Russian Anti-Plague Institute Microp at the Russian Federal Service for Surveillance on Consumer Rights, Protection and Human Well-Being, which is the leading organization from the 2015 uh, within the uh, Coordination Council for the problems uh, of uh, epidemiological threats uh, on the territory of uh, CIS. And again, when we speak about CIS and ECA, and we're jumping from uh, one region to the other, like Central Euro uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia and CIS, we understand that Eastern Europe and Central Asia is not a union of states, but this is... Um, just a mere space uniting the Eastern Europe countries and Central Asia. But when we speak about CIS, this is already official existing union of uh, independent countries and states, and all the member states of CIS are still uh, within uh, the borders of the EECA. And this is just a commentary from my side, because I will speak uh, partly in my presentation about EECA and the CIS. Correspondently. The next slide, please. Here you may see the main directions of our cooperations within the framework of the programs that I was speaking about. For example, this is uh, cooperative field work, uh, expeditions in cooperation uh, in terms of monitoring of uh, outbreaks, uh, natural outbreaks uh, of. Uh, of pest and other uh, infectious diseases. And I need to state that this field work uh, was renewed and reconsidered after a long break within uh, due to the realization of the named programs. This is also execution of uh, cooperative uh, research works, scientific works. Uh, training of uh, medical staff and specialists, which is uh, already and every time a uh, topic for us. And we are using different forms of uh, such trainings, like training courses, uh, online, off offline uh, courses, uh, trainings on the basis of Federal Service of Surveillance and Consumer Rights, uh, Protection and Human Well-Being seminars, and other types of trainings. We are providing for betterment of information and analytical works and support uh, within uh, our work. Uh, we are developing analytical and informational systems, which I will uh, disclose a bit later. And we are also supporting material and technical bases, hardware bases of um, profile agencies of the countries of EECA. And we've performed and uh, are ever performing the deliveries of laboratory equipment, diagnostic drugs and substances and um, other substances and materials 
also with uh, car-based uh, mobile laboratories. Next slide, please. And further on, you may see the main results of our cooperation within uh, the realization or along the realization of the programs that I stated already. Starting from 2015 to 2020, we've delivered 18 mobile laboratories to the six countries of the CIS. And here in the upper left corner, you may see this microbiological laboratory for express diagnostics on the basis of gazelle uh, car type. So this is a universal chassis that is uh, uh, hosting uh, all types of diagnostics like uh, polymerase chain reaction, immune uh, reaction, luminescent microscopy, immune chromatography analysis. And together with this, we are providing to the countries of uh, EECA mobile laboratories that are uh, the part of a mobile SPEB complex uh, at the Russian Federal Service for Soviets on Consumer Rights Protection and Human Well-being. We are dealing with Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Belarus Republic, and we are pl planning to work with Kyrgyz Republic, which is uh, already stated uh, on one of the sessions yesterday, uh, Astabek Kabilovic from Kyrgyz Republic is uh, now saying yes to this and supporting these activities. And we ran uh, already uh, a lineup of courses preparing uh, more than 200 specialists in uh, the matters, in the first line, in the matters related to the programs of uh, the specialized anti-epidemics uh, gr group uh, of uh, response groups. And as of now, we are dealing with the issue of uh, creation of a registry of specialists, profile institutes and agencies, state bodies within the CIS countries that uh, uh, already are covered by the training program of uh, the emergency response groups trainings and uh, who have professional compet competencies, knowledge base to work in case of a necessity within uh, a mobile complex of uh, the emergency response uh, for epidemiological threats. And when I speak about the united information epidemiological uh, space uh, and uh, modeling of uh, better exchange and information we have provided for these purposes automatized uh, workplaces, I mean here computer devices, uh, digital devices that are corresponding to the certain criteria and I mean modern computer devices right now into uh, eight countries we have delivered 18 automized uh, servers and on the U United Server of Microbe Institute, we have uh, digital programs for monitoring of uh, natural outbreaks and emergency response uh, system. And on the next slide, you may see that as of today, the Microbe Institute has a huge practical experience especially within the scope of reaction to the or response to the urgent emergency uh, or in the uh, epidemiological threats and our specialists are ready to share their experience their best practices to all parties concerned on uh, within the EECA and the first line uh, with the representatives of the CIS countries what is our experience you may see it on the slide this is a participation in uh, fighting Ebola in Guinea Republic from 2014 to 2016. And by the way, there, uh, at the time of 2014, we've uh, launched a group of specialists from the Microbe Institute and Vector Center at the uh, Russian Federal Service for Surveillance on Consumer Rights, Protection and Human Well-being, and two special modules of uh, the um, Unified Emergency Response complexes that uh, were left in Guinea Republic as uh, the gift from the uh, from Russia. And as of now, these modules are uh, in good operating state there, and they are working autonomously autonomously from the autonomous electro generators starting from 2014 and now it is 2021 so you can imagine but 
And so why we do all that? Because in the Republic of Guinea there are some problems with the power generation and we cannot work just on the baseline of the regular power grids. And um, our equipment or high equipment of a high cost can just get out of order. And so this is the fact that speaks on its own. Our equipment working autonomously is quite a reliable one and one can work on this equipment against some difficult conditions. And of course, it's very important that taking into account the experience and expertise of work in the Republic of Guinea, within uh, one year, back in 2016, we created the mobile unit of the emergency response of the second generation. And uh, alongside uh, a set of parameters, it is uh, well ahead of the unit of the first generation. And uh, here we also have some training facility to train some personnel for this mobile units. And back in 2019, before COVID-19, we managed to conduct a large-scale international training, it took part, it took place in the city of Saratov. We fully deployed the mobile unit of the emergency response and uh, 72 specialists and professionals from uh, eight CIS countries uh, took part in that, 82 professionals from eight countries. And this training was quite uh, a successful one. We addressed some epidemiological tasks as well as we conducted some research of uh, the samples, of lab samples. We decoded all that, sequenced, analyzed and uh, it was actually the first time when we conducted such a large-scale intergovernmental study and training. And uh, also we published uh, a guideline, a book, upon the results of this training. And this is a book about the international emergency measures on the territory of EECA. Next slide, please. Another accent that I would like to put in here is that our institute, Microbe, has been researching and developing mobile laboratories uh, since 2006. We got obtained 20 patents for the mobile laboratories of the different profiles. Here in the picture you can see some photos of these laboratories. So we have the express laboratories, so the express diagnostics. Uh, the first one appeared in 2006 and uh, it was the laboratory of uh, indication and uh, the epidemiological surveillance and reconnaissance, reconnaissance. Then we've got the second generation of these laboratories back in 2015. So this is a laboratory of express diagnostics. And uh, we supply them to CIS countries. That's what I mentioned before. And as of today, we've already developed the laboratory of the third generation. This is the laboratory of uh, indication. You can see it uh, at the bottom of the slide, uh, in the middle of it. So the third uh, generation laboratory is quite different from the previous ones. It was uh, quite re-equipped and one can say that this is a new level in developing the mobile labs. In 2017, we developed and designed the mobile laboratory for the monitoring and diagnostics. Is, it was based uh, in the Kamaz uh, vehicle and uh, it is uh, aimed at the research of uh, epistemological monitoring when it comes to the natural foci of plague and some other infections. Next one, please.
And here I can't help but mentioning our cooperation with our uh, regional European office of WHO. Since we are talking about the network uh, within EECA, but we do understand that all this is interconnected, and I believe that Oleg uh, would support my words. And here I'd like to mention that the European Office of WHO with the participation of the Institute of Robert Koch and Federal Service for the Surveillance and Consumer Rights Protection and Human Wellbeing, uh, we developed the typology of the mobile labs and uh, we identified and distinguished five types of the laboratories and you can see all these five types on this slide. And in Microbe Institute, as of today, we have all the types, perhaps except the first one, the super small labs, we don't have this one, but all the rest of the types uh, are presented and uh, are located in our institute. And this year, we conduct some active work con jointly with the European Office of WHO, and we try to achieve such tasks as the development of minimal standards for the mobile laboratories. We also are working on the information support on logistics. We are also working on the organization of international training and drills. And Anna Yurovna mentioned it yesterday in her speech. We plan to organize these kind of drills in autumn this year in the city of Kazan in Russia. Of course, if uh, everything goes well. And we hope that the current pandemic will not thwart our plans. And on the, base, on the basis of our Microbe Institute, we are working on the creation of uh, the coordinating center of WHO on the uh, preparedness or on being prepared to the pandemics and some responsive measures against the backdrop of emergencies. Well, it's quite a novel work for us. This is uh, absolutely another level. I believe that this is a very useful and valuable work when it comes to the experience and expertise and skills that we will get. It is very useful also within the un unified and common network on the territory of EECA. Once again, I'd like to underline that all these processes are intensively interconnected. Well, one does understand that any cooperation in any field, in any area, across every profile and function should be supported by the regulatory and methodological documents. These documents could turn this cooperation into kind of a structured work. And we also work on this. We've been actually working on this for quite a number of years. And uh, we do it within the Functioning Coordination Council of CIS on the sanitary protection of the territories. I need to say that it was created back in 2000. And uh, over this time, we've conducted 14 regular meetings. And um, in 2020 and in 2021, we've already conducted and held uh, seven irregular meetings in a video conference format. These meetings were devoted to the problem of COVID-19. And within the activities of this coordinating council, we developed uh, drafted two very important documents, in my opinion. First, this is the uh, document on the information exchange between CIS countries on emergency situations 
and uh, this is done within the creation of a common info information epidemiological space. And the second document is the draft agreement on the cooperation of CIS countries in the field of uh, the response to the emergency situations in the field of uh, public health, uh, of the sanitary and uh, epidemiological field. So the first document, uh, the provision on the cooperation within the CIS countries, it has already been uh, adopted. The second document has been approved and currently it is going, uh, undergoing as an internal approval within the national states and after that it will be submitted to the Council of uh, the Prime Ministers of CIS countries. Next slide, please. And another aspect that I believe to be very important. Today, we conduct some work on the creation of the baseline of fundamental organization of CIS countries. It will monitor, inform, and uh, collectively respond to emergencies of uh, the epidemiological and sanitary nature. Rospotrebnadzor, the Russian Federal Service for uh, Surveillance and Consumer Rights Protection and Human Well-Being, submitted to, to, to the meeting of the Executive uh, Committee. The Executive Committee approved, uh, adopted this initiative, and I believe that this year we will review this issue within the Economic Council. Yes, I see that Helena Vladimirovna notes that uh, it will definitely take place. We hope that this provision will be adopted. The main target of this organization, uh, you can actually see some targets on this slide and I'll probably not read all of them. Now let's pass to the conclusions. I've already presented to you the, the main elements of our work, the pillars. But the main conclusion is that as of today, resulting from the activities that we've been doing for the seventh year already, we've built a unified system of monitoring and time response to emergency situations of uh, sanitary and epidemiological nature uh, in EECA. We unite more than 15 profile units and we also have created the Situation and Coordinating Center on the base of uh, the body, the unit that is working under the Federal Service for Surveillance and Consumer Rights Protection and Human Well-Being of Russia. So this is a permanent process. It is not, it has not ended. To make the system work properly, one has to be in constant uh, interaction, cooperation. We have to conduct continuous work to that extent, and we do this. And the colleagues who are present in this room today are well aware of all this, and they support us across all our deliberations here. And so I hope that we will continue to uh, conduct some active work in this respect. And I hope that uh, due to our joint efforts, we'll achieve some good results. Thank you. Thank you very much, Igor Gennadievich, for your extensive and informative report. It was very important for us to know more about the coordinate, coordinating role of uh, your institute and uh, uh, the Federal Service for Surveillance and Consumer Rights Protection and Human Well-Being on the territory of EECA. Uh, thank you very much for your good words on the cooperation of your institute, the Federal Service uh, on Consumer Rights Protection and uh, the WHO European Office. Uh, we'll give the opportunity for questions uh, to our audience after uh, all the presentations are done. And now I'd like to give the floor to our our next uh, presenter, who is Elena Shamal from uh, CIS Executive Committee. And uh, her presentation sounds very interesting, uh, which is the COVID-19 pandemic lost opportunities and new horizons. Elena, the floor is yours, please.
Can you please put my presentation on the screen? Dear colleagues, can I use the clicker? Or, oh, okay, I see that it works. All right. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. As um, everybody has already said, this topic, the traditional, uh, this year, the traditional topic of the conference that has always been about HIV and AIDS. Uh, uh, this year it has been extended and widened and um, over these two days we are talking about the epidemiological well-being, about different issues within this context. And of course this is uh, far from a coincidence. I see something happening with the screen. The world situation uh, of COVID-19 is quite tense, and it persists to be tense. The situation in CIS countries with COVID-19 also persists to be quite intensive. So we see that the uh, average indicators uh, across all the countries are more or less the same, but the Armenia and Moldova uh, stand out a bit of this context. At the very beginning of the pandemic, we were working in CIS within the three main documents. First, the agreement on cooperation in the field of healthcare. It was adopted back in 1992. Then, the agreement on cooperation in the field of uh, sanitary protection uh, back uh, in 2001. It was adopted. And the next one, the agreement on the cooperation between CIS countries in the field of emergencies and the creation of uh, emergencies. Uh, it was approved in, uh, adopted in 2015. So COVID-19 is indeed uh, the challenge to the whole humanity and uh, one country cannot stand alone in it. And here the international cooperation plays uh, one of the key roles and occupies one of the most important places. Then the Executive Committee of CIS countries within the international cooperation uh, interacts with uh, more than 25 international organizations. The main partners of ours are the UN, the WHO, and UNAIDS. The main um, body when it comes to the cooperation within uh, the healthcare. This is the Council on the Healthcare, and uh, it consists of the ministers of health and uh, the chief sanitary physicians from 10 CS countries. Uh, this year, the chair country is the Republic of Belarus, and uh, the Federal Service for Surveillance and Consumer Rights Protection and Human Wellbeing is the leader in terms of the sanitary and epidemiological well-being. And with the satisfaction, I can mention that uh, starting from the very beginning of the pandemic uh, in CIS, we've been cooperating quite in a timely manner. Last year, the heads of our states uh, met twice. And the topic that were topics uh, that were discussed, uh, the topics on the COVID-19 were also discussed uh, within the uh, ministers of uh, foreign affairs as well as the ministers of health and chief sanitary physicians of CIS countries. A bit, bit later, I'll talk about the role of the coordination council that fights against the spread and uh, bringing in of. Um, contagious diseases. And we also have created a working group to analyze the COVID situation. And uh, on a weekly basis, we publish information uh, bulletins. Uh, last week, we published the 55th uh, bulletin. And another information platform that has been uh, given to us uh, by Macrobe Institute, you can take a look at it. And in an online format, uh, you can read uh, easily and write easily 
your observations and opinions. So yesterday, uh, those who participated in our sessions, you probably remember that Anna Yurovna Popova mentioned and underlined one of the main documents that was adopted by the Council of the Prime Ministers. This is the statement uh, in connection to the novel coronavirus infection. and. Uh, the initiative came from uh, Federal Service for Surveillance and Consumer Rights Protection and Human Wellbeing. It was uh, reviewed uh, in the Coordinating Council. And this statement uh, says that the pandemic is indeed a threat to the whole humanity and the CIS uh, member states are aimed at intensive cooperation to fight uh, against this uh, novel disease infectious disease and separately the statement underlines the cooperation within the council on uh, the cooperation and also there is an order to develop some new documents on not only fight against the coronavirus COVID-19 but also to establish some strategic approaches how to prevent infectious diseases. In 2020, there were two uh, meetings of the ministers of health care and uh, chief sanitary physicians. And the first meeting was uh, the urgent emergency. And the, uh, there was only one topic, what do we do, how we will interact with uh, COVID-19. And the members of the board discussed the um, measures taken in the member states, quarantine, events and the efficiency of quarantine and also we managed to urgently develop and discuss and promulgate five documents on our cooperation within the sanitary and epidemiological well-being and the meeting of 28th october 2020 was more um, profound and the members of the council discussed the organizational functioning of the healthcare systems during covid period um, understanding that we are not only uh, putting our efforts in uh, fighting the infection, but we also have huge groups of population that need uh, to get help rendered independently of the epidemiological situation in the countries. We also discussed facilitation of works uh, f related to the patients with diabetes mellitus, oncology, and according to the Belarus Republic initiative, uh, the set of information materials for the patients with diabetes was developed with the proper recommendations on what to do and how to use it. We also put an accent on uh, the emotional and psychological well-being of patients and medical staff and uh, within the framework on uh, the council, we have a basic organization in uh, psychiatry and narcology that is working along this line of works and introducing its own recommendations. A midterm plan. As you may see, this document is also supporting the uh, decree of the Council of the Heads of States, and the main idea is the prevention of epidemic of infectious diseases in member states in general and building up on potential in uh, uh, fighting against the infections. There are five directions, 23 events along this plan. And as Igor Gennadievich in his report stated, he also put some accents, we are uh, going toward the shaping of the overall legal basis and development of the registry of specialists, members of specialized unified emergency response uh, groups. Uh, we are also developing programs for support of these specialists, trainings of these specialists, and support of their operational readiness. I will later dis describe why do we need this. And in um, part of the development of scientific potential, we are planning the development of uh, cooperative research in immune biological drugs development and other drugs development, uh, scientific expeditions, uh, offline works, aimed on actualization of information on uh, the nature sources of uh, plague. So the plan, uh, the plan will be realized uh, in 2021-2022. 
for two years. Uh, as Igor Gennadievich stated, we've started the work on uh, the agreement in cooperation within the scope of sanitary protection. During the 20 years of cooperation within this agreement, uh, there were more than epide 10 epidemics and pandemics in the world. The uh, international sanitary rules are adopted. And, uh, and uh, again, our work was started before pandemics. And we've planned to introduce changes as a protocol. But now we understand that taking into account the global situation and the features and changes that we are introducing into the international document, today we are ready to provide for a signature of the heads of state the agreement in a new edition. While working on this agreement, we were taking into account not only the necessity of a clear realization and adherence to the medical sanitary rules, but we were one step ahead because we understand that one year or two, in one or two years, the whole world will interact within the international classification of diseases of uh, 11th uh, edition. And in this context, we are also introducing changes and to the agreement we've attached a list of the diseases for the member states of CIS. Uh, that will be uh, supported by the sanitary epidemiological uh, events, respectively. Distinguished colleagues, I want to recall that the pandemics of COVID is not only one question that we're dealing with within our cooperation in uh, prevention of infectious diseases. On the territory of member states of CIS, we have 45 hertz of uh, 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 plague and by the way in 2019 the coordination council developed methodology or uh, methodological recommendations that contain uh, the consecutive works and directions for main control and uh, pre prevention uh, of this uh, hazardous infection on the territory of CIS. Is it a joke or not a joke? But still, I want to say that uh, while I was preparing to the uh, report today, there was a document that was adopted in 2019 with a slight glaze of irony. Because in 2019, we were not under a transport collapse. Uh, there was uh, a passenger circulation on aviation. Passenger flows on the CIS uh, included tens of dozens of millions, and in the world there were hundreds of millions passengers. And thanks God, today we are going out of this uh, state of limits. But uh, according to the initiative of Belarus Republic, there were two documents developed that re re regulate medical provisions for aviation companies, peculiarities in rendering of medical services to the passengers and crew members uh, at, during uh, within the framework of operations of civil aviation. And uh, one document that uh, let me smile were the meta methodological recommendations for organization and handling of sanitary anti-epidemic events in case of um, uh, the uh, dead body or uh, live person opposing the emergency uh, and uh, having the international significance at flight within uh, civil aviation. So we were prepared, although we did not know to what. And distinguished colleagues, as of now, we have a good grade of readiness of one more international document, and this is the draft of agreement on the CIS for prevention and reaction for emergency situations within the epidemiological threats. Uh, the ones who were online and offline yesterday on the presentation on the report of uh, activities of uh, the emergency response groups, today our first presenter also touched upon this topic. And this agreement draft has uh, the goal to regulate uh, the activities of emergency response groups in, uh, emer in different emergency situations to make it easier to uh, make cross-border um, transportation of these groups. And it goes out of the framework of the ministries of health care. Uh, here we are inviting for the de development of this document the customs 
uh, border agencies and we are optimizing the approaches to shaping of the emergency response uh, systems. Um, we are analyzing their territorial presence and on the 10th of June we have planned the next meeting on the discussion of this agreement and we hope that at the end of this year we will be able to pass it for the supreme organs of the uh, CIS. As Igor Gennadievich told in his presentation uh, about the activities of Coordination Council during pandemics, and in 20 years of this Coordination Council, uh, it showed its unity and professional approach in uh, the uh, challenging issues and questions. There are representatives of all 11 member states within this council and on uh, the sittings of the council, operative meetings of the council, the members of the board are discussing different topics. And with every meeting, the list of questions is um, being wider and wider. Because if at the beginning of our cooperation there were questions like how, where, and what to do within the framework of special services, what are the events to be imposed, what is uh, working, what is not working, how to organize uh, the activities in schools, in um, healthcare system, the topics still are very wide. And today these issues, these questions are also getting a new status of the, the development of knowledge on immunization, use of specific and non-specific prevention, uh, preventive tools. And I want to say that the WHO, practically speaking, is uh, cooperating with us on every meeting. Uh, we have presenters from WHO and uh, Alek Nikolaevich. I want to thank you for this, especially because you are also our colleague and participant of all of these events. And as Igor Gennadievich already told during the first presentation that in this year, um, the platform of uh, Microbe Institute is planned to be uh, established as a basic organization. And this was the idea um, that uh, was fostered starting from 2003, because from 2003, Microbe Institute is the basis for operative and informational exchange for the situations and for a certain list of inf infectious diseases. Therefore, we have many, um, many works that are finalized. We have preliminary uh, um, we have preliminary acceptance, and on the 14th of June, the status of basis organization will be provided for the Institute Microbe. And as I already told, the vaccine prevention as of now is one of uh, very important topics, study of immune status, uh, the pace of uh, immune prevention. We wanted to increase it, but still, I hope that the platform for manufacturing of vaccines Sputnik V in the Belarus, in Kazakhstan in Belarus Republic it will correct the situation and this issue or this question will be enhanced and distinguished colleagues the year 2020 was challenging and in December 2020 there was the first meeting that was held not only in online mode but also in personal mode uh, in uh, offline mode uh, within the CIS. This was the international conference organized uh, by the R Russian Federal Service for Soviets on Consumer Rights, Protection and Human Well-being. We were discussing COVID and mobile laboratories were handed over to Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. One more international platform, as I stated, is the UN. And this year, we also had a meeting with the Secretary General at the UN in discussing of cooperation of international organization, uh, organizations in fighting against COVID-19. The year 2020 is a challenging year, not only due to COVID-19, but we also remember that the states uh, got this obligation for uh, implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and, of course, HIV and tuberculosis. SDG issues are in the field of our view and uh, there is a state uh, accepted obligation and on the platform of CIS our statistic committee is uh, running analysis and monitoring of the goals of sustainable developments 
and we've issued four information and analytic compendiums that are showing the situation for performance of SDG. And I want to state here that for the CIS, we are using 111 KPI, 97 of them are common for all states, and 14 are specific for certain states and member states. And in the context of HIV, let us see what will be in 2020, because 2019, we have the results that are showing the increase in HIV infectious cases in uh, all member states of CIS and tuberculosis and hepatitis. Uh, B incidence is also showing positive dynamics, but it is a bit early to make any statements related to this, as I would say. As Alek Nikolaevich told, why is the topic of uh, the lecture this one? Because from the very beginning I told you that uh, on the CIA, uh, within the CIS, starting our struggle against COVID, we were using the way of cooperation within three international agreements, and as of now, at the end of the year, we have six international documents, and we are also planning, so taking into account the experience of uh, uh, the lessons learned from 2020, we want to start the corrective measures and introduction of changes into the agreement on HIV cooperation. And we are also correcting and will correct our work in filling in the project of the agreement on rendering of medical help to the migrants and members of the families of these migrants, working migrants. So taking into account all the experiences that we've gained and here the healthcare uh, council uh, within the CIS is working within the uh, uh, Coordination Council for Infection Diseases and starting from the end 2019 we went to the development of a uh, mixed document, the project of plan, with, uh, of plan of working with antibiotics and of course the international platform and international cooperation is the line of our efforts when we are doubling our efforts, when uh, the lessons learned uh, are learned and uh, the corrective measures are taken. And it's very important when we can see the results of our work and when our colleagues from other international organizations are cooperating with us distinguished colleagues. At the end of my presentation, I want to wish good health to all of you. I want to wish you success and free roads, free borders. Thank you very much. Yelena Vladimirovna, thank you very much for this very interesting report. It was very interesting to listen to the ever-growing role of the Executive Committee of the CIS as a platform for cooperation dialogue between different countries. And now this is also uh, UN and WHO. And for the last presentation within our session, I want to let the floor to the Dr. Dmitry Anatolyevich Lioznov. Director of the Research Institute of Influenza, Smarodinov Institute, Russia. Dmitry Anatolievich will join us in online. Dmitry Anatolievich, I hope you can hear us. Let us check the connection. Distinguished colleagues, do we have an established connection with St. Petersburg? We are now checking the connection. Dmitry, if you can hear us, you may start because we see your presentation on the screen. Dmitry Anatolyevich, could you please turn on your camera? I hope you can hear me. I will go on. Yes, so in the year 2017, the WHO and... Yes, I've started. Thank you very much for your patience. So, starting from 2019, the WHO defined 
the main risks. For public health, and you see the list of these main risks. You, you see that the half of these risks is bound. Unfortunately, we cannot hear the sound. So, and now I want to speak about influenza. This is a social. Uh, socially important disease, and we face the global strategy on flu for 2019-2030. Unfortunately, there is a sound glitch, and uh, still we can not hear the main presentation. Uh, he is on the general channel that we can hear very vaguely, but he should. Somebody should get him to switch to the Russian channel. Dmitry Anatolyevich, please choose the Russian channel because we cannot hear you very well right now. So the global strategy for flu for 2019-2030 has concrete defined goals. So to decrease uh, the uh, events of season flu, to minimize the risk bound to zoonotic types of uh, influenza and to uh, to deal with uh, the follow-up of patients and to provide for a follow-up of flu pandemics. This is our view of the strategy for 2030. Unfortunately, we still can't get the sound from the speaker, so we'll wait until the technical issues are addressed. Dmitry Anatolyevich, if you hear us, please switch to the Russian channel. Dmitry, if you can hear us, please switch to the Russian channel. Hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Can you please send a message to Dr. Lyoznov that we cannot hear him. Everybody can see your slides, but not hear you. You should switch to Russian channel. Unfortunately, we had some technical problems with St. Petersburg. I'm sure that Dr. Lyoznov will share his presentation and it will be available for the participants of this conference. I'd like to conclude and I also would like to organize. Can you hear me now? Yes. some correct link no you need to switch to russian channel there's a button interpretation on the bottom of your screen can you see that i see the record interpretation 
Так лучше? Все, все, все. Дмитрий Анатольевич, мы вас очень хорошо слышим. Сейчас меня слышно. How about now? Can you hear me now? The offline studio says yes, we can hear you. I hope, dear uh, participants online, that you can also receive our sound without any problems. So, the pandemic was announced because this is the absolutely new, not absolutely, but this is a principally new virus. It is different from those viruses that were present before, and it can be transmitted from one person to another person, and it can be spread globally. We don't have any immunity, or we have a very low immunity. And, for example, we had a situation back in 2009 when uh, the population, especially the population of aged uh, people, had some immunity to this virus. And uh, that's why younger people or middle-aged people suffered most. And. Um, we also see some clinical characteristics. So the pandemic doesn't depend on the season. Uh, the flu pandemic, also if we look back at 2009, we do remember that it didn't start uh, according to the regular season, as well as it ousted all other viruses that usually used to be present in the season. And so now the influenza or flu for us is quite a seasonal one. It has become a seasonal one. One needs to say that our meeting, so to say, with the pandemic potential can happen at any time. If we take a look at the history of uh, the last 20 years, then we will see that each year we identify some pathogens that do have the pandemic potential. Sometimes it is limited to animals, sometimes some uh, single cases of human infections are registered as well. But uh, here you can see 2009 and uh, there was a, a virus, uh, PH1N1, uh, and it has become the pandemic virus. Today, in the world, we have the uh, GISRS. This is the program by WHO. This is the one of the oldest ones and most successful ones. Uh, 121 countries participate in that. In some countries, there are even two national centers. For example, Russia also have got two national centers in St. Petersburg and in Moscow. We have uh, cooperating centers, reference centers as well. And within this uh, global uh, system of monitoring or GSRS, we have two subsystems, the traditional one and uh, some so-called signal uh, surveillance. So all these uh, systems, especially if we talk about the traditional ones, so we've had there for over last 50 years. So the methodological recommendations were published back in 1967. And over the last years, we drafted uh, three systems uh, and they are working in parallel. That's why we can say that this is the multiplex system, traditional signal and uh, hospital surveillance, three components. We have different uh, timelines, uh, different regions uh, in which we work. So traditional surveillance, uh, epidemiological surveillance, uh, 51 region, uh, are involved, regions are involved in that. Then the signal, uh, clinical epidemiological surveillance, uh, it was submitted uh, or proposed to uh, do in 2010, and this system started and was launched uh, back in 2010. And it had and still has 10 bases. And the hospital surveillance, it's been in operation for uh, seven years. And each year, we enhance uh, the number of uh, the hospitals that take part in that. Main goal here is to limit the negative effect of flu, as well as to communicate the information to the uh, 
authorities to limit the number of morbidity uh, and um, death rate. And uh, we've, we saw it on the example of the pandemic of COVID-19 last year. The system is being uh, continuously developed. And what I wanted to add that this is a continuous system. What does it give us? This is the early identification of pandemic viruses, then the identification of the beginning and the end of the seasonal epidemic or pandemic, then the uh, identification of etiology and uh, the severity. So this is not about uh, the clinical characteristics, but this is about the expression of this process. Last but not least, uh, we also aimed at uh, identification of the relevant uh, strains. So antigen characteristics uh, are identified across the whole world, and then the WHO issues recommendations to the producers uh, on the strains that should be included into the vaccines. So this committee gathers in February and uh, says which strain should be included into the vaccines. And so here you can see the routing of our information flow. It all starts with the clinics and uh, then it is all sent to the Federal Service for Surveillance and Consumer Rights Protection and Human Wellbeing. Then the information is passed to the Research Institute of uh, uh, Flu. Uh, this is for the lab uh, testing and research for sequencing. And after that, on a weekly basis, uh, the the Federal Center of Flu Control submits this information to our Ministry of Healthcare, to the Federal Service for Surveillance and Consumer Rights Protection and Human Wellbeing. It passes all the information on uh, the flu. And uh, also our National Insti Research Institute passes this information to the WHO and its uh, regional offices. In our case, it's European office. So this system, and it was mentioned today within the International Health regulations. Uh, this information is passed uh, to the governing health bodies. As I've said, the system is being uh, developed continuously and today uh, we not only talk about the epidemiological data but also we do uh, the molecular diagnostics and phylogenetic analysis. Here Russia does not lag behind the colleagues and um, in 2015 and 2016 that uh, full uh, genome sequencing was introduced. We were the second country in Europe that did that and over the last season we were at the second place on the number of uh, sequenced uh, flu viruses among all the countries of the European region of WHO. And so this experience allowed us to respond to the challenge of COVID-19. We created a consortium on sequencing and uh, we got more than 82,000 of samples that were studied and as you know, the Russian uh, Institute of Epidemiology will accumulate all the data that we get on the sequencing of the coronavirus from the whole country. Then the signal surveillance. Here we get additional cl uh, information from clinics and laboratories. So this is an individual uh, approach. And uh, it is different from the traditional one uh, because the traditional one just registers the statistics. And signal surveillance currently is in operation in 19 hospitals and in 14 clinics in different regions and in different federal districts. Uh, this allows us to have more or less a full picture. The system of signal surveillance is quite a standardized one and it allows us to gather information that can be compared not only to different regions in this country, in Russia, but it can also be a large element in the chain of the world data. Uh, we have uh, patients with a severe respiratory infection. 
they are hospitalized and we get this information from hospitals and we also have patients with respiratory infection and those infections are treated in clinics and so we have criteria what is the uh, severe respiratory syndrome what is uh, just a standard respiratory virus etc and then we create an individual card uh, in the clinic or hospital where the patient is um, held uh, or treated we take into account the clinical picture the vaccinal status and uh, also the administration of antiviral medication and so in online regime it is all filled in into the database and uh, this allows us to use uh, all this information And this online format allows us to identify the etiology. And so it helps us not to overlook some case that could be quite dangerous and that has the epidemic potential. So here we can identify the risk factors because we get the data from the clinics, we get epidemiological and um, other types of data, demographic ones, for example. And we also try to assess uh, the effect of vaccination and uh, antiviral therapy uh, for these patients. All the data that we collect uh, is integrated in the system of traditional surveillance and uh, we integrate it and fill, in it, uh, fill it in in the international database. That's how we can compare our situation with the situation in other countries, because the system is quite a unified one. It is a, it is a simple, single one, and it was uh, suggested by WHO. For example, during the last season when we had flu, we surveil, surveyed uh, the severe respiratory infection, and we decoded the diagnosis for 36 percent of patients so 17 percent of all this was the different types of flu uh b flu then we also have uh, uh h1n1 and uh about 19 percent uh were suffering from some virus of another etiology And here we can see that uh, Rena virus and uh, Eras virus are uh, dominating here. And also the seasonal coronaviruses that we always have registered, they account for just uh, about 1% among those uh, patients that should be accepted into the hospital. Also, we can see the demographic data. So what infections are met in which groups of ages. For example, for children from 0 months to 12 months, uh, this is mostly A. And for other groups, uh, we see that other groups suffer more from uh, flu, especially when they are hospitalized. And uh, when it comes to the group uh, 65 years Plus, we see that uh, ERAS virus is also quite common among them, and they can suffer from some lung damage quite a lot. And so when it comes to the traditional and signal surveillance, so, well, we see the traditional system at the uh, upper part of the slide and the signal one at the lower, at the bottom of the slide. So the characteristics are all the same, but when it comes to the signal surveillance, this is more personalized and uh, it allows us to get the data from the clinic. So this is not only about epidemiological surveillance, but also about some clinical data. And another type of surveillance here is the hospital one. It is a quite a new and pilot project. We get the detailed characteristics of our patients since we have some large and extended survey for, for our, uh, for, or from our patients. 
unfortunately, you have just one minute to to uh, finalize. Okay, so uh, today we see that uh, some hospitals are participating in this pilot, uh, such uh, from such cities as from Saint Petersburg, Moscow, and last year we had about four thousand people uh, participating or patients participating in this project. So to conclude, uh, the global uh, system or GI. SRS is working. Uh, it allows us to identify the pathogen quite fast to help to develop the methods how to diagnose it. There is an interaction between all the organizations within the network, uh, including the international ones, and it allows us to exchange uh, the data on the laboratory diagnostics, on epidemiology, etc. Today, the system has been included into the diagnostics of COVID-19. And uh, I want to state that within this global system and the, with the support from WHO, we get the agents for diagnostics from WHO. And uh, it, uh, on the one hand, allows us to work for, for the benefit of our country. And on the other hand, we can also provide the global community with the data that we get. And uh, in the WHO strategy, it is mentioned that uh, jointly with the introduction of uh, international health regulations, the flu is still a priority, key priority. And we need to uh, develop our system of surveillance as well as uh, develop everything that is connected with the prevention of flu. And this is actually quite um, close to other pathogens of uh, infections and, uh, for example, COVID-19. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dmitry, for your very extensive and interesting report. Unfortunately, we don't have any time left for questions, so I'd like to very briefly sum up the conclusions of the session that we've held and uh, let's include it into our resolution of the OVA conference. So first, I'd like to state that the morning discussion has shown that no country, no single country, no single organization can face and address the global pandemic on its own. And in this respect, the networks, sub-regional, regional and global networks key a play a play a key role in response to when it comes to the response to the emergency. Enforcement and the development of regional, sub-regional and global systems is a priority task. And uh, this enforcement can be done as follows, through the training of uh, professionals, then the creation of databases, registries, the training of uh, specialist professionals. Secondly, we should also coordinate and communicate within the network and uh, within different networks. This is the key um, success factor, especially against the current pandemic backdrop. And definitely, we need to cooperate, uh, cooperate and cooperate. Thank you, dear colleagues. This discussion seemed to me very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good day and have a fruitful day at the conference as well. Thank you.